It is my honor to invite our first storyteller into the spotlight, George Worthington. George and his wife have been married for 50 years and have three children and five grandchildren. He comes from a proud line of emotionally constipated Swedes and Germans. <laughs> and judging from his last name, there was probably an Englishman under the bed. George will be sharing his essay, I'll Risk It. Emotionally constipated, eh? Huh? <laughs> that changes when I get in front of a microphone. <laughs> About 40 years ago, I went through uh, outpatient treatment for alcoholism. Part of the recovery process is to tear down the wall, the, the alcoholic facade, and find the real person who cowers behind it. There was a young girl in our recovery group who had trouble doing this. The counselor kept badgering her. Why can't you tell us who you are? Frustrated, the girl blurted out, I'm afraid to tell you who I am because if I do, you may not like me, and I'm all I've got. I face the same risk tonight. If I tell you about my mental illness, you may not like me. But if I don't, I preclude the possibility that you might like me in spite of it. And if I remain silent, I wouldn't be helping to erase the stigma that is attached to mental illness. So I'll risk it. This is my brave. I've battled clinical depression all my life. As a child, my parents used to ask me, what's wrong with you? Why don't you go out and play with the other children? As I matured, the illness manifested itself in ever-changing ways, each more evil than the first. But this evening, I'd like to focus on more recent events in my life that might shed more light on the insidious illness that I've dealt with for so long. In 2006, I had a heart attack that required a quadruple bypass. My physical recovery went well, but my depression became chronic and more acute. The depressive episodes lasted longer and became deeper and darker. I felt like I was trying to swim in a pool full of molasses. I retired in August 2008. I wasn't anticipating any problems, but my wife told me that I seemed lost and that the slightest thing made me very angry. I lost my appetite and occasionally stayed in bed for as long as three days at a time. I became reclusive and didn't even want to see my grandchildren. I didn't want them to see the corrosive ugliness in my soul. During the winter of 2008, my psychiatrist suggested that I try electroconvulsive therapy, in which the brain is shot, causing it to seize up. The seizure causes a change in brain chemistry that, in essence, rewires the brain. The treatments lasted for six weeks. They helped a little, but not nearly as much as my wife and I had hoped. I was in a hole, so dark and so deep that I had to look up to see the bottom. In 2010, I attempted suicide. My wife had wanted me to go to church with her, but I didn't want to go because I knew I would feel ashamed and embarrassed among the members of the congregation, people that I had known and loved for 30 years, people who had been praying for my recovery. So I stayed home. I began to think that maybe everyone would be better off if I were dead. My feelings of worthlessness had continued to spiral downward, and it seemed there was nothing I could do to stop it. My wife, my children, and my friends would be better off without my poisonous presence. Perhaps my wife could find someone who was more fun to be with, someone who had more love to give her, someone who didn't require so much care. I took an overdose of sleeping pills. I woke up in the sterile, harsh light of the emergency room at Methodist Hospital. I don't remember much about it except that my wife was there. She put on a good face for me, but I could tell that she was angry and scared. Later, I was moved to a regular room for a couple of days, and my wife and children took turns coming to see me. Why were they so angry at me? Couldn't they see that I thought I was doing a good thing by trying to free them from the tyranny of my mental illness? Well, the ebb and flow of brain chemistry can distort reality and, cause, and, cause, and exert a tremendous force on emotional stability. 
But unlike the ocean tides, it is completely unpredictable, inexplicable, and deadly. It was only a matter of time until the depressive episodes began again, even darker and uglier than before. I began seeing a different psychiatrist. Perhaps I just needed a fresh start. From the beginning of 2011 until the middle of 2016, we tried numerous medications. Now the process for this is tedious. It's full of disappointment, anxiety, and frustration. It takes two weeks to taper off a medication that isn't working and to gradually introduce a new medication during the same time. Then another two or three to determine if the new med is gonna work. If it doesn't, the process is repeated with yet another medication. Some of them worked for three to six months, and some didn't work at all. Damn it. <laughs> six years of severe mood swings, damn it. In July of 2016, my psychiatrist said, we've tried every reasonable option in the medical medicine cabinet. I think we need to consider shock treatments. I reminded him that I'd been down that road before and that it hadn't worked. But it was the only option left, so I took it. I had 15 treatments over a five-week period. We didn't see much improvement. My doctor suggested bilateral treatments in which both sides of the brain are shocked. Sure, what the hell, we've tried everything else. <laughs> I had five of them. I began to feel better. Did I dare to hope? It's kind of like when Charlie Brown goes to kick the football and Lucy pulls it away from him at the last moment. <laughs> Mental illness had been pulling my very life out from under me for longer than I could remember. My cup was empty. There had been so many failures that I'd forgotten what success feels like. But I also had the benefit of an amazing, loving, and forgiving wife. And so I dared to hope. There's a happy ending to all this. I still have episodes, but they only last about a day, and they are not frequent. I am deeply thankful for my family and friends who stood by me in my darkest hours. Without them, I wouldn't be here tonight. Last September, about two months after the successful shock therapy, my wife and I celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary by going on a cruise down the Danube River, something that I couldn't have done only a couple of months before. Then a couple of months before I had a, a couple of months ago, I had an odd moment of clarity. I realized that after 74 years of living with mental illness, I wasn't ever going to be completely rid of it. And for the first time in my life, I'm okay with that. I refuse to be ashamed anymore. It's an illness, just like heart disease, cancer, or diabetes. Diseases that carry no stigma. Diseases that receive millions of research dollars every year. We deserve no less. Together, let's risk it. Thank you.